Now, before I show you what I wrote down on this sheet of paper, uh, how many different responses do you think I heard in this room? Not many. <coughs> Not very many. Not very many. <coughs> Which means if you guys are all going to say the same thing, what are the folks at MP Dog saying? The same thing. Beautiful. What are the people Prudential saying? Same thing. How about any of your competitors in the city? Same thing. If you're going to do and say the same thing that most realtors are going to do or say, what should you expect to get? Same now, what's your name, Rob? Beth. Beth. How old would you say this sheet of paper is? Very. Would you say it's been around for a little while? It's almost, you, you almost want to wash your hands after you touch it. <laughs> Beth, what's the first thing I wrote down? What do you want to think about? <laughs> okay, okay. What's the second thing I wrote down? Okay. Okie dokie. Uh, what's the third thing? When can I call? When can I call you? Does that pretty much cover a majority of you in this room, yes or no? Now, the funny thing about this little old beat up sheet of paper that Bev wants to wash your hands now after touching is this. <laughs> this sheet of paper has not just been in real estate offices across the city, but it's been in real estate offices across the country. It's also been in auto dealerships across this city and across the country. It's been in insurance companies, home improvement, security, business machines, people who sell office furniture. I know what you're going to say before you say it, folks, because I know what your competition is going to say before you say it. If you're going to say and do the same things everybody's going to say or do, you should probably expect to get something different. Don't be surprised. Or to get the same. Don't be surprised when you get the same. Can you all follow me on this? This is a very simple objection to overcome because it's not a what? It's not even an objection. So what is it? To stall. To smoke screen. It's an apparition. Think about it. It's almost, a pre, it's almost a program response. Uh, how many times have you been into a department store? Somebody comes up to ask you for help. The first response out of your mind is what? Just, just looking. I mean, you actually may need their help. But I'm just looking, and then two minutes later, you're going, where is that person? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's programmed. Just like I want to think about it, it's programmed. Here's the one thing I can pretty much guarantee you. By the time you're sitting with your clients, what have they already done? They've already thought about it. Decisions have already been made. But we've got to find out what the true objection is because there truly is something that's stopping them from moving forward. And until we know what exactly what that objection is, we cannot take it to the next level. Write this down right alongside your sheet. One, two, and three. Let me give you three steps to overcome this objection. The first step to this is to agree with your client. Why is agreeing with them important? What does this do? Validates. Validates. And what else does it do? Let's know that you're concerned with them. You're listening to them. It takes them off guard. They're not expecting you to agree with them. So when you take, when you agree with them, you take them off guard. Uh, again, what's your name, sir? Jerry with a Jer cheesy smile. Jerry with a cheesy <laughs> smile. Jerry, <laughs> tell me you want to think about it. Well, you tell me that you want to think about it. No, no, you tell me. <laughs> you tell me what you want to think about it, and I want to redo my. Okay, thing. Jerry, I want to think about it. Well, let me give you some things to think about. There's a couple points you can think about here. Okay, and then you try it with me. Okay. Tell me you want to think about it. I want to think about it. Jerry, that's fine. Obviously, you wouldn't think about this unless you were interested, would you? True. What did I just get from Jerry? A yes. A yes. Positive response. How did I get that from him? Turning by agreeing. By what? By agreeing with him and using a technique from the 50s called a tie down. It's a question at the end of a statement that guarantees me a what? Yes. A positive response because it's the way you phrase it. The second step is to ask for consideration. Ask for consideration. So, Beth, may I assume you'll give this very careful consideration? Yes, indeed. What have I just got again? Yeah, so now I've got my clients give me two positive responses in roughly three seconds. The more times they say yes, it's harder for them to say no. Third step. What is your name, my friend? John. John. John, what was your response to this objection? Uh, to qualify and find out what it is they want to think about is the prices third step is to give them choices. Why is choices a crucial thing? Why is what John did crucial? What does choices do? Puts them in control. If you ask them what they want to think about as an open-ended question, you leave the entire thing. For those of you who have said, well, what is it you want to think about? How many of you have heard this response? The whole thing. You have nowhere to go at that point, but when you do what John did, and that's give them choices, what do they tend to do, John? Pick one of the choices. They tend to pick one. I mean, is there something I've forgotten to cover? Is it the home? Is it the service? Is it the price? Is it the whatever? When you give them choices, your clients tend to find out what the one objection is and they latch onto that one. 
that gives you an opportunity to find out, fix, and isolate that objection. Can you all see how this works, yes or no? Based off this, you will find out what the true objection is in under 30 seconds and be on your way to handling it. Not saying you're gonna close everybody you get in front of with this, but I will tell you one thing, it will be a much better opportunity than what you're doing right now. Step three on your worksheet, write this down. Plan for success. How many of you in this room have goals? Can I see your hands, please? Where do you keep them? Written down. Where? In my bill folder. In your bill folder? Where do you keep yours? It's like more on my desk. Beautiful. Where do you think most people keep them? You know, if they're in your head, they're not a goal. They're a wish, they're a dream, they're a fantasy. You gotta put them on paper. When I first got into sales, my manager called me to his office. The first thing he ever gave me was a thing of lipstick. I'm not gonna lie to you, it scared me to death. He said, Nick, I want you to go home. I was 18, I said, oh, I'm not coming back. He told me, I want you to write down your goals on your bathroom mirror. Yeah. It was one of the smartest things I ever did because if your goals are written in lipstick on your mirror, are they hard to ignore, yes or no? Now, I'm not saying you've got to go to that level, but you need to have them written down. Now, here are the three that I wrote down. Number one, you got to come up with an income goal. you got to think big about your goal, but keep it what? And it's realistic. Last year, I was in New Hampshire. I was in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, actually. I was at the Keller Williams office. And I asked the group of folks there, I said, how many of you in this room have any income goals? And this guy in front raised his hand. I said, well, what's your goal, if you don't mind me asking? He said, no, no, my goal is to make $1.3 million a year. Is that an impressive goal, folks, yes or no? Yes. Now, I don't come across people in real estate who make seven figures off that. I may be bumping into one once a month. So I thought, well, maybe this is the guy I'm bumping into. And I said, that's great. So we took this goal and we dissected it to what that goal would be per month, per week, per day, per hour. And I said, hey, how close did you come last year to this? He said, oh, I made about 30 grand last year. <laughs> Folks, I'm all for thinking big, but we got to keep things in perspective. Can we all agree with this? I mean, let's. Let's crawl before we go on to a sprint. I mean, so let's figure out what our goals are and put them in perspective. I and mean, let's just put a basic one out there. I'm sure some of you are exceeding, but some of you may not be at yet. Uh, $100,000. How many of you in this room would like to achieve that in the next 12 months? Can I see your hands? All right, to make $100,000 a year, you gotta make how much? $8,333.33 a month. What have I done with that goal? Broke it down. That's just over two thousand dollars a week, four hundred dollars a day, or it boils down to about fifty dollars an hour if you work eight hours a day, five days a week. I have made this goal a realistic and achievable number for you. Now, income will be the easiest one you come up with. Some of you may have a goal less than a hundred. Some of you may have a goal that exceeds that. Do the same math. Now, once you come up with your income goal, you've got to come up with a production goal. How many homes do I have to sell in order for me to achieve this goal? We said earlier you make on average, let's just say two thousand dollars a transaction. If I want to make $100,000 a year, I have to have how many transactions in a year? 48. 50. About 50. Now, some of you are going, oh my God, that's just so much. Oh, that's just, that puts me completely out of that market now. Thanks for crushing my dreams. But no, it's how we look at it. 50 transactions is how many a week? Less than one a week. Now, some of you are going, well, that's still four a month. But we can break this down to even more realistic. And that brings us to the third set we're gonna write down. Not your income, not your production, but your activity. activity. Folks, activity is what makes everything go around. You are all given 86,400 seconds at the on start of every day. What you do with that time is only up to one person and that is nation's number one salesperson in America is a woman named Melissa Cohen. I've known Melissa for well, six years now. She's based out of New York City. And before any of you in this room go, oh, well, that's New York. If I lived in New York, I could do that too. No, you couldn't. <laughs> so let's lay everything on the table right now. No, you can't. Melissa's in the mortgage business, so she's in the comparable industry of what you are. Melissa did in 2009, 1,055,000,000 in real estate transactions. Based off of that, her average income boils down to roughly $30,000 a day. She's married and has kids and lives a pretty decent life. Folks, I'm not saying that we're ever gonna achieve that number because many of you in this room will never even come close to that and that's okay because we've got other priorities. But we've gotta put our goals down. We've gotta have them on paper. Activity is everything. If it takes you 100 no's to get a yes and you've gotta get four yeses a month, that's only how many a month? 400 no's. We can divide that, it's about 12 no's a day. How hard is that to get? 
Guys, how hard is it to hear 12, no 12 times in a day? <laughs> Very easy, is it not? I and mean, let's just go out there and get rejected, guys. It's, I mean, selling is again what? It's a numbers game. Step four on your worksheet. Make a decision. If you are happy and content with your level of production, my advice to you again is to keep doing what you're doing. But if you're not happy, we've got to change. One of my friends and mentors is a gentleman by the name of Brian Tracy. Has anybody here ever listened to Brian Tracy before? Now, Brian says if you want to be growing in your business, you should follow the 444 philosophy. And I want you to write this down. Four, four, and four. Three fours, 12 things that you should do per year for yourself. The first four he asks for us to do is to read four books a year. Now, every time I look at a group of people and say, I want you to read four books a year, guess what I hear from most of them? For most of them, not from you. Oh, no, I, no, I wasn't saying that right. personally. I thought oh. that's what they said. Oh, no, no. Most of them will look at me and go, oh, God, who's got the time? Oh. Four books, oh, that's just, it's, it's, four books a year is one book how often? A quarter. Every three months, a quarter, every 90 days. That's three pages a day. Folks, if you don't think you've got the time to accomplish three pages a day, here's my advice. The first book you buy needs to be on time management. Is that fair? <laughs> All right. The second four, listen to four audio programs a year. UCLA did a study a few years ago. They found out the average American spends 300 hours a year in their car. How many of you in this room believe you fall into that category? Can I see your hands? If you spend half that time listening to educational material, as opposed to talk, radio, or music, that would be 150 hours a year, or the equivalent of nearly seven days. Folks, call me crazy, but if you listen to something for seven days, are you going to retain new information, yes or no? Just by osmosis, you're going to know more about whatever you're listening to before you got in that car. I mean, you can go grab a CD program on quantum physics, listen to it for a week, you will know a couple things about what? At the end of that period of time. The last four, go to four events a year that inspire change. How many of you in this room have been to seminars before or workshops? Can I see your hands? How many of you in this room when you were there actually took the time to move around that room and network and meet other people? Who ever did that? Who attends those events? What kind of people? There are three types of sales professionals out there. There are top producers, there are average producers, and there are lower end producers. I've been doing this for nine years, folks. Two of the three groups attend with a high degree of efficiency. Which ones are they? Top? And who else? Bob. Why do the top producers show up? I mean, they're the ones who are doing all the business. Why would they be there? Sharpness. When we see a top producer, what do we see? Success. We see success. We see the numbers. We see the trips that they go on. We see the, the lifestyle. What don't we see? The work that goes behind it. I have never met a top producer who looked at me and goes, I don't know how I did this. Don't know, just, <laughs> just one day I walked in, and next thing I know, I'm just selling all this. I mean, most of them have a formula that they work for. Can you all follow me on this, yes or no? Lower end people, why do they show up? They're, they're, they're kind of in a position where it's either make it work or move on. I mean, can you all follow me on this one? The people we miss most often is the middle group, and what do you think most of you wind up in? Why? Why don't they change? Has it gone bad enough? <laughs> See, many people will say, well, the middle group is what? Content. Yeah, I hear that a lot. And I honestly, in my opinion, I see that as an excuse because let me ask a real blunt question. How many of you in this room are content with where you're at? That's my point. The reason why most of you won't change is not because you're not content, it's because of what? I don't know how to. No, fear. See, here, here's, what, here's what goes on with most of our minds. If we do something different, there's a chance we might what? Fail. And most of us want to avoid failure at all costs. Let, let's talk a little bit about this. You know, last year when I was over in New Hampshire, I was actually staying in Boston. One of my bucket list goals was to go to Portland, Maine and have lobster. I just wanted to have lobster in Maine. I know it's a stupid goal, but it was on my list. I drove to Maine, had lobster, went to this little gift shop to buy my kids some presents. Now, when I was in this gift shop, they had one of those big, oversized fish scales. Has anybody ever seen those things before? It was a working one. I stepped on it. 
I'm not somebody who's ever really paid much attention to my weight because I've always been active. Even though I eat a lot, I was, I was always active. I didn't get winded when I went upstairs. So I never thought my weight was an issue until I stepped on that scale. And I saw it go past 280, 290, past three, all the way to 340. That scared me to death. I thought it was wrong. I thought it was lying to me. So when I went back to Boston, I went to a regular scale that you got to put the change into to weigh myself, and that one lied too. <laughs> That's just how it was. I, I didn't see myself as being 40 pounds over 300, but rather 60 pounds away from 400, which is at my point, just roll up the casket, just hop in and get over with. So I said, you know what, I gotta change the way I'm eating. I just can't do this. My, I'm getting into my 30s, you know, I mean, I've already passed my 30s. I mean, pushing the 40s, the metabolism's just not what it used to be, so I, I had to change. Now, if I tried to change my diet all at once, what would have happened? I would have what? I would have failed. We all know how that works, correct? But does anybody here know how long it takes to make or break a habit? 21 days to make or break a habit. That goes back from the study done in the 50s in the military. 21 days to establish a new habit. Let's look down at your hands. Now, some of you in this room put your right thumb over your left thumb. Some of you put your left thumb over your right thumb. I want you to reverse your thumbs. How does that feel? <laughs> it doesn't feel right, does it? As a matter of fact, I'm sure most of you right now just want to <laughs> and get right back to what feels normal. You know, our government did a study on this. This is where our tax dollars go. I want you. There was somebody in D.C. somewhere and went, you know what? Get a committee together. I want to figure this out. And, 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 and here's what they found out. They found out if you put your right thumb over your left thumb. Can I see you folks? Right thumb over left thumb? Let me see your hand. You had a higher intelligence over the left thumb people, so congratulations. Where are my left thumb people at? Can I see your hands on that one? That study showed you had a higher sex drive over the left thumb. The, the, the funny thing about this, the funny thing about this right now, the right thumb people's egos were up real high. They were looking around going, that's right, left thumb people. If you need help doing that, just, just let me know. And as soon as that happens, all of a sudden the right thumb people are going, well, you know what, that left thumb feels pretty decent. That actually feels actually almost natural over there.